Hello and welcome back to another episode of Object Oriented Programming. Last time, we learned about data hiding. We learned about how we could use the private and public keywords to decide whether something, be it an attribute or a method, is accessible outside the class or not. Simply put, whatever is marked private cannot be accessed from the main function or anywhere else. Of course, that's not the end of the story, right? We still need to manipulate that stuff somehow. And today, we're going to take a look at the mechanisms required to do that. If you remember this picture from last time, essentially, what you need are public methods that act as a gatekeeper to manipulate and access the private variables only, you know, in a fixed way. These methods are called accessors and mutators. An accessor, as its name implies, is a way for you to get stuff. So that's why it's also known as getters in some cases. And a mutator is a way in which you can change stuff, also known as a setter. So going back to the ball class that we've been building, let's take a look at how we can build some getters and setters so that the outside world can access, you know, the stuff that we've represented as the private variables. Let's take a look. So this was where we left off last time. We had our class up here with our private attributes defined up here as well. So now let's try and include some mechanism for the user to view these values. And as it turns out, this one is really simple. The user could ask for the size of the ball. Of course, since we want the user to be able to access this, it has to be of the type public. It returns an integer, right? The size is an integer amount. Let's give it a descriptive name, say get size. And all this function needs to do is to return the size. That's it. This is a getter. All it does is provide a gateway for you to touch the actual variable itself. Let's do the same for the other variables. Let's do one to get the color. Right. We simply return the color like so. Again, same idea for position and being lazy, I'm going to just copy and paste. This one is get position and the return type is simply the position. What I have created here are my three getters. I'm going to write a little comment here to make this clearer. Of course, the other name for it, right? The more rigorous name for it will be accessors. So that's what these functions do. They allow the outside world to access your variables. As you can see, if I move down here, and what I can do is instead of, you know, asking for the display function to run, I could instead try and directly print out the value of the ball. So I would say B dot get position like this. So get position is public. If I were to refer to position itself, that wouldn't work. Let us now go ahead and compile. Of course, everything compiles well. Let's run this and you will see the value three. So the get position function is how you can actually go ahead and touch the value of this. Something that you couldn't do because it was private, right? But now you can by going through a getter. The same idea works for mutators or our setters. So let's go ahead and write just one setter to change the size and the color, right? We're not going to do one for the position because technically we've got a mutator for that here. All right, so let's call this the proper name, mutators, and let's go ahead and write them. Now, the pattern looks a little bit different here because the type is now void. You're not returning anything. Let's call it something like set size. And in this case, we take in a parameter, this parameter being the new size that you actually want to use. When we say set size, we can then go ahead and set size to whatever the user has passed us. That's it. This is a complete mutator. Let's do another one for color. Same idea. We return nothing, but we take in a string that represents a new color. Then we simply say color equals to C. There you go. These are our setters. Now, these are examples of simple setters. You basically just take in the value from the user and reset the variable. End of story. However, as you can see, that's not the only way we can do our mutators. This function, for example, is also a mutator, and we've actually already been using it. The kick function is a limited kind of mutator. You cannot directly reset the position. You can only change the position as a result of doing the kick. This hopefully shows you the power of using mutators. If you have a fixed set of rules regarding how certain variables should behave, you can enforce them 
by using a mutator that limits the kind of things the user can do. That is the power of having accessors and mutators like this. Everything is completely within your control. Now, let's go ahead and test this. Let's say we set the color to something like green. Why not? Then let's replace this line with the original b.display. Now, let's go ahead and compile our code again. And as you can see, we have managed to set the color of the ball. We have managed to, by going through the mutator, change up the actual value inside the attribute. And those are your accessors and mutators. Now we can properly interact with our objects, right? And we can properly manipulate the information held with it. Now, let's move on to look at something else. You notice when we created the ball, there is a little bit of an ugly problem here. The size starts off at zero, the color is null. This of course is because, well, that's the default values, right? And now that we've seen our accessors and mutators, we can fix this problem by mutating the object after it's been created. But that seems rather counterintuitive. Surely there is some mechanism that allows you to put in these values at the moment of creation. Well, yes, you're right, there are such features, and it is known as a constructor. A constructor is just another method within your class that basically helps set everything up. So far, we've been relying on a default constructor, which is empty. It doesn't do anything. It just constructs for you the actual objects and that's it. So instead, we're going to build our constructor now, and we're going to teach it to put initial values into our three attributes. Let's take a look at how this is done. Before we begin talking about making a constructor function, let's first take a look at the construction step, which is actually right here. This is when the constructor is implicitly called. By just calling a function that is the same name as the class, with the keyword new in front of it, that's what we're doing. We're saying we want to build a new ball object. Right now, because we're using the default constructor, we are not able to specify anything else. But what we can go ahead and do is to build a more dynamic constructor. This is how we do it. A constructor is like any other class method, but with a few changes. Constructors are usually public. There are some situations in which it is not, and there is no return type. You can simply leave this out and go straight into the name of the function. Now, the name of the function is also fixed. It must be the name of the class. So these must match. Now, let's set up the constructor so that the user can specify both size and color. So let's say something like this and something like this. So the user will pass in these two values. We will go ahead and set size and color to these two values that have been passed in. That's it. We now have a more powerful constructor because it's able to do more. Technically, what we've been doing so far is we haven't actually initialized position. We've just been changing it directly, which yeah, technically it's a little bit of a no-no. So let's go ahead and fix this. Let's set position to zero. Hopefully you can see the contrast between these statements. This constructor allows the user to set size and color, but not position. Position always starts at the beginning, right? Zero. So again, hopefully you can see the power of having methods inside a class. Everything is within your control. And if you want to forbid the user from doing certain things, you can always fix the values directly like this. Anyway, with the constructor there, let's go ahead and tweak this up. Previously, we had to set the color separately, so let's take this away. And now, our ball is simply constructed with the two values. Let's say I want a ball of size 3 with the color red. Let's take a look at what result this gives us. We'll compile our program and run it. And as you can see, without having to call any other functions, these values have been stored into the ball. Thanks to the fact that our constructor is able to do some things to set up an object for us to use, we can simply construct the object with all the information in place. That's the power of a constructor. And there you have it. Before this episode, we know that there are attributes and methods, but we didn't really do too many methods. And today, we've seen all possible methods there are. Essentially, most methods are, well, what we've seen, right? Accessors, mutators, or the constructor itself. So what we can now do is we can go back to your spaceship homework. At this point of time, 
your spaceship should only contain all the attributes on their own. You're not really able to construct a new spaceship, at least not in any meaningful sense, but now you are equipped with the relevant knowledge to do so. So now go ahead and add constructors, excesses, and mutators to your classes. And let's see if you get them right. That's all there is for this episode of Object-Oriented Programming. I hope you found today's episode useful, but until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.